Welcome back to Absolutely. My name is Hassan, and today we're joined by a special guest. This is Mr. Cardiac here, and he's going to be talking to us about Iron Man 3. Don't forget to check out our sponsors. We are sponsored by Into the AM, where Benny wears all these soft, beautiful shirts all the time, and Gamer Subs. <laughs> What, Betty? You didn't like my my plugs? You just went. You like you just went one, two, three. You're just like knocking them down. But <laughs> trying to hit them in a roll. Here, you can you can give us the codes for Gamer Subs. And... Gamer Subs is just use code comics at checkout. They've got waifu cups coming out every Friday this month. Mystery cups. I posted about it over on Comic Storyin. Make sure you go check it out. But what you know, you, you see, you did one thing wrong. One thing wrong. I did wrong. When you mm -hmm. introduce the guest, you then toss it to the guest so they can introduce their no, projects. No, I did. I just forgot to. I, I thought of that as soon as I said it. I forgot to do the brand spot, which I don't know if we're doing. Half the time when, when you're not on a video, I simply don't do them. So No, you have to. That's the rule. That's how we get paid. We'll be better about it. <laughs> anyway, guys, yes, today uh, we are joined by our guest, Cardiac. Why don't you introduce yourself and I'll explain why you're here. Oh, uh, yeah. Um... That was good. My name is Cardiac K, specifically. Um, I'm an upcoming YouTuber who makes some comic book analysis, uh, anime and manga analysis videos. So if you like that, check out my channel. There you go. Uh, yeah, you were tweeting out that you wanted to do a Patreon video in which you discussed Iron Man 3 with your buddies. And since right now we're kind of in a weird drought, I thought it'd be great to, after, after I checked out your channel and was impressed with your quality and your professionalism, I was like, hey, if you're if you're up for doing AMD style videos, why don't you join us for an AMD style video? I can't get much more AMD style if we're not if we're there, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it is an honor. I appreciate the the invitation to just be here. It, it truly, it's gonna be a great episode for us. It is. So let's uh, before we get into my complaints uh, <laughs> and Hassan's complaints because he loves everything. Uh, why Iron Man 3? Why did you pick that one? Because I left it for you to pick any movie for us to watch, and you said Iron Man 3. So why that decision? I think in a in a weird like way, Iron Man 3, uh, at least to me, uh, well, first off, I think it's like a 8 out of 10 movie. You know, I think it's a perfect movie to conclude like Tony Stark's character arc across the trilogy. But specifically for the MCU and the spot that it's in right now, I think it like kind of parallels the things that a lot of people complain about the MCU for, uh, which is like a, a lot of in phase four, things not being necessarily connected to the multiverse or being connected to Kang, things being more self-contained. Um, and just like specifically, we just got off of the Thor trilogy, it having to most people not a conclusive, well, not a, a, a likable ending for the character of Thor. Well, actually, no, that wasn't the end of the trilogy. That was the fourth movie. But regardless, one of those top three characters who didn't have a good legacy movie. And I think right. that Iron Man 3 is another one of those like controversial uh, movies in that series for like those three main characters of the MCU. Yeah. Um, so I just think it, it like, per it kind of fits into, you know, the modern thing of the MCU right now. Oh, I, I actually really agree with you on that. And go back to your Thor point real quick. It's funny because Thor, I felt, had a great trilogy. Four now tarnishes that because you can't look at Thor without Love and Thunder as a part of that package now. It's a four movie series. It's not a trilogy anymore. But uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, if, for the record, going, I will admit, going into this, I was expecting, I don't remember enjoying this as much before. This came out at a time period where I wasn't doing a crazy comic story. So it was more I went to go see it myself, had my own opinions. I was expecting a three out of ten. Coming out of this, actually, I kind of want to, other than one my major complaint I have, I'd give it like a nine out of ten. I'd go higher than you. Hey. Yeah. No, that was great. I didn't, I had literally no issues, like, other than the comic book slash like animate there was iron man animated adventures that was airing around the same time this came out and they had an incredible mandarin presence he was a big part of the show he had the makalon rings it was really fun other than that because i wanted that it was great i remember walking out of the theater that was being my only gripe but i had a fun time and um you know we we complain about marvel's clunky floating head cg and i think this is like before that um yeah. it looks really really good and you see tony stark in a way that you don't see him in any of the films before and you certainly don't see him in any of the films after um, yeah and like we do really see that totally different side of it which i didn't really i actually really enjoyed my, i mean my only complaint you're saying mandarin i actually didn't mind what they did with the mandarin now that might yeah. be because they retroactively fixed that problem no no and i like it now <laughs> and, and as like a viewer even 
after I got over myself of like, I really wanted Iron Man Armored Adventures, the cartoons Mandarin, because it's really cool. He puts on rings and he summons a suit. It's badass. But yep. like, that's a that's like a CGI animated show that that didn't do well enough to even get its finale. So, you know, whatever. Uh, it's a really fun interpretation. And Killian's plan in this movie is really, really good. So we yes. can talk about that later. But I think it's like, it's actually the most well thought out villain plan. And if he got his goal, the way he would have succeeded is perfect. Like, I mean, he has everything that he'd want. So, yeah. My biggest it, it, issue with this is actually the length. Uh, I When I started it up, I was expecting the usual that era MCU, 90 minute, fun, poppy. You know, I, I remembered it being slow in the middle, but now watching it a second time due to its length, I see why I felt it was slow the first time I watched it and why we had so much downtime. Uh, I will admit halfway through it because I was I set aside an hour and a half to watch this. I did have to pause it and go do something else. I was like, I got an hour and a half. I'll watch this. So I ended up pausing it right after he left the kid. Like it was like, so it wasn't a terrible spot to pause it. I was like, okay, this feels like a good spot. I got to run to the store. I'll come back and finish the movie. Um, but yeah, that's my only major complaint. I feel like weirdly, if I was going to trim anything actually isn't the, the slow moments of Tony. Cause those are what I actually really liked looking at everything uh, across the board. It's how long that last fight kind of stretched out. Because Tony kind of had it under control in general. So if I was going to trim anything, I'd say I'd trim that fight down, basically. I love get... that fight. That spectacle is so fun. Well, and, and overall, I do like the full length of the movie. I thought it was fine. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 in my, in my rewatch. Like, it's because I do enjoy the movie. But like I said, my only major complaint was lengthwise. It just felt kind of long for what it was trying. Because we almost have... We have three acts, but they're like 45 minutes a pop. You know what I mean? Oh. Like we have Tony trying to figure out what's going on. Tony failing and then trying to build back up. And then we have house party, which is great. You know, yeah. like <laughs> it's a crazy conclusion. I, yeah. I'm actually on a different wave than y'all too, even with the high regard that I hold in it. Um, I think the worst part of the movie is easily the first act. Like I was like coming into here, I was like, okay, uh, rewatching the film. I was like, okay, even though, yeah, we have the pseudo sequence, which is amazing and really reminded me of like that era of not only Marvel movies, but just like superhero movies in general, where we got a lot of uh, pseudo sequences, um, a lot of like musical cues going into like action scenes, like specifically um, when Happy swung on old dude um, mm -hmm. right before he got attacked. Um, a lot of like musical cues like that, that really reminded me of stuff. But like just how slow, in my opinion, the first act was to put everything into place to reintroduce Killian to Tony's life, to force his ex to get to the house and like just her be there when he gets attacked. It's like, well, why, why did you do this? <laughs> like yeah. that, it, it just, I don't know. There were a lot of like string together for things to get into place for that second and third act. But you're right. Once, once we got Tony alone with his own thoughts, with the PTSD happening, with all the pent up stress happening, his relationships deteriorating, everything being stripped from him. I think that that is like what this movie is all about at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. And I, and I rock with you too. It almost feels like this movie had a different villain in mind entirely. I think the girl was supposed to be the villain. I always forget her name, but like the way that this movie feels is that she was supposed to be the villain. Right. But in like the final rewrite, they were like, no, uh, we can't have a female villain. Uh, it's a woman. How could she possibly be a man? This is Ike Perlmutter era where he, Ike Perlmutter and Disney executives had more pull than Kevin Feige was allowed to like run the ship. Right. Um, and I feel like they changed that because something about it feels off. Um, I did a reread of Extremis actually recently, um, which is weird that you wanted to do this. And I forgot this. This was the Extremis movie. For some reason, I thought yeah. it was two. Uh, I believe she's the villain in that. Now, bear in mind, I reread it like three months ago, and it's not one of those stories that normally <laughs> sticks with me because it's the extremist story arc. The problem with it is, it's the beginning to a whole series of things. Yeah, it's not really standalone. Like it's great, but it's not really truly standalone. Um, but I actually wanted before we jump over, I did want to bring up the PTSD thing because that's one thing I think bothered me about the original uh, viewing of this for myself. The length I know with the slow parts. But when I first, when did this come out? It was like 2013, I think. 2013, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So I had just left the military in 2012 at that time. Like it was right yeah. around that time frame. And one thing that bothered me early on coming out of the military when I was trying to adapt back to civilian life, keep in mind, I had been in the military for 10 years. I had been to Iraq. I had been to Afghanistan. I had seen people abusing PTSD, lying about PTSD, faking PTSD. And I, in re-watching this, that also stood out with me, the way that he's acting about it. Now, at the time of coming out of the military, 
in my head, it was I, I've been dealing with this 100-guy unit. Everyone kind of deals with PTSD in the exact same way. Now that it's been, I've been 15 years removed, I see different ways people are dealing with it and how they cope with it and stuff like that. So I think my mindset was a little more accepting of the way he did his, he, he portrayed the PTSD. While back then, I was very much more, no, you're just an actor. You don't know what it is and you're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? Like that, and that kind of bothered me, I think. So that's definitely yeah. a fair point. It manifests in very different ways and different types of anxiety. Yeah. And that, well, and it's something that I've come to learn over the years now. Because like I said, in the military, the way, general way we all deal, dealt with PTSD, being in an infantry unit and being in a medical unit where a lot of guys dealt with it, the, if, the military deals with it in a way of like, we just bottle it up. We bottle it up. You might go talk to a psychiatrist, but you'd never show it, like kind of a thing. You just get more, I guess, stoic and quiet, and that's when we know you're dealing with something. So having seen just tons of people dealing with it in that manner and coming out of the military and not dealing with any civilians – to me, that just seemed overacted and wrong, and you're just portraying it improperly. But So I think that's one thing that has changed for me watching this in 2013 and watching it now, and that's why I wanted to mention it, because watching it 2013, actually 10 years. Wow, okay. So 10 years since we originally saw it. <laughs> yep. My mindset has opened up a lot more about how people cope and deal and you know, mental health and all that other stuff. So Yeah. yeah. And of course, looking like from the outside, looking at, and of course not have, having to deal with that, seeing how that was incorporated with uh, the traumas that he was facing from the Thanos visions, because that was also happening at this time. I, I think it was more touched on in the next movie, in the uh, Age of Ultron movie, though. Yeah. Um, but seeing how seeing how he was dealing with all of that, and I specifically when I was talking about this, I was gushing about it on Twitter, like for the past like two weeks. Um, someone had brought up that actual criticism from them was the fact that uh, the veteran aspect of Killian's plan, of him being a vet, and then also, of course, like former people from the military being basically his targets for the extremist thing, um, wasn't really addressed in the movie. Uh, not by Tony, not even like when Killian was doing his monologue or anything. And like, just to address that, I don't think like that, that's not really a part of what the movie's trying to address, if that makes sense. Like, it's it's brought up, and although, like, it's it's highlighted by the fact that Tony does go to the site in which um, uh, one of the veterans, like, had you know, an encounter with extremists and it failed miserably. Um, right. I don't think that... Say, right, with the shadows? Yeah. Or whatever, like, okay. Yeah, with, with the kid and with the shadows. See, I, I watched this one, Hudson. So. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I just, I don't know, like, see, even though it would have been potentially better for that to be a theme and a talking point of the movie, I just think that, like, for the most part, and I like the way that it did this, it was able to put that in the underlying, like, commentary of the film without, like, pressing the issue, if that yeah. makes sense, but still dealing with the ramifications of it on Tony specifically, which just, like, highlights, like, yeah, this is just centralized on Okay, Tony's really the only moving character in this entire film. Like, there isn't much effect on Rhodey's character. Pepper is sidelined like halfway through the movie. Yep. Uh, Happy's, of course, taken out. I mean, Rhodey was sidelined too. Rhodey's just like held yeah, up, yeah. like, all right, uh, don't get in, don't get in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's just doing nothing for like that entire part. Um, but I think just like that more central focus on Tony really exemplifies like everything that this movie does to just develop his character. Um, yeah, they definitely you see a lot of growth in these movies and that's often when like you get a little bit angry when you watch Age of Ultron because you see the lengths that he goes in this one and they don't address why he would fall back during Age of Ultron. I think that this really, you know, uh, set them up for a layup with a really great storyline of Tony. You know, he destroyed his suits, but you, you leave some measure of anxiety in his system or something. This one, it's like, hey, I'm cured. I had the best sleep of my life is how the yep. movie ends, you know. And then you pick up Age of Ultron and he's neurotic and he's making Iron Sentinels and then he's making Ultron. And he's doing all these things and he, he created the villain of that movie. So it's like the narrative cohesion wasn't where it was at by like Endgame, where I feel like you watch Thor Ragnarok, right? You go from Thor Ragnarok to Infinity War to Endgame, and there's such cohesion, even though there's a different director who starts it, from his narrative all the way through to the end there, right? And I think that's really, really interesting. That uh, It kind of reminded me, early MCU definitely told... Like, I love this. I would take this over, like... 
I would take this over Ant-Man, Quantumanium. I would take this over Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness. I would take this over, like, most of the recent movies. i take it over Black Widow any day of the goddamn week. Uh, <laughs> most of the movies I've seen in the MCU stuff, I'd definitely pick this. Uh, well, just because... Oh, God. Yeah, just because. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I, was, <laughs> I, just I was wanted to make you feel awkward. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just, I liked it a lot. It's, it's a different time period in the MCU, and it's funny because I feel almost like the MCU has learned the wrong lessons. Like, if you look at what's come out recently, let's, let's compare Iron Man 3. Let's look at Thor The Dark World, which I don't think is a terrible movie. It's just not a great movie. Like, everyone forgets that the MCU had missteps leading up to 2018's Endgame, like, or 2019's Endgame, whichever year it came out. I think it was 18? No, 19. 19, 19. 19 yeah, because they couldn't continue because of COVID. Anyway, everyone... Like everyone likes to look back now as if that 10 year plan was perfect. Everything came out without an issue. There was no hitches. There was no problems, but Iron Man three. And I remember this being the complaint back then is it closes Tony's story. It was over. And then they brought him back for age of Ultron. And then he had another issue in winter soldier. And he's, you know what I mean? Like we continually had all of these issues that were built upon, but his story ended in Iron Man three. Yeah. That narrative lack of cohesion, I'm going to go like pretty much what kind of with what you're saying here, is things that I don't think people realize existed back then. They all assumed it was like this perfect 10-year plan, everything worked out perfectly, but it didn't. It, there was a yeah. lot of complaints and a lot of problems, and what I feel like is going on today is the MCU as a whole has taken a lot of the complaints that came in. A slow movie like Iron Man 3 is considered one of the worst movies in the entire MCU. A more serious-toned movie like Thor Dark World is considered one of the worst movies in the MCU. But you know what was a success? Thor Ragnarok. You know what was a success? The quippy, fun, enjoyable movies. And now they're trying to do that all the time again. And I feel like that's part of the issue because you have these new actors, these new directors coming in, and they're like... Oh, I know what the MCU is. I pop a few quips here. I make some goofy comic book costume and we go forward and they don't, they're not the Rooster yeah. Brothers. They're not Feige and all that stuff. But feels like they're working off like a Mad Libs template rather than actually like yeah. creating something with heart. And, and honestly, it could be the machine of the MCU where they, they do want to tell a really interesting story and Feige and exec comes down and says, no, uh, how we make our movies is by the third act, we giggle. And then we cry, and then we smile because it's over, and everyone's happy. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's definitely something fun to think about because if you think about trilogies, right? Um, the ideal way to have done Iron Man three for narrative cohesion to keep us going is you do the Civil War thing, right? Where it's like it's the third movie of a trilogy, but it's almost a pseudo Avengers movie, just so that you can introduce Tony as a part of the greater universe, and no matter how you close out his story, you kept it open enough that he's part of these other characters' lives. Yeah. Versus Iron Man three, which I it's a mixed feeling. It's definitely a mixed bag because we don't necessarily need that because uh, I, I love this movie for what it is. And I have a big issue with Civil War because it's like I would have loved a standalone Captain America 3 that isn't a baby Avengers movie because I love the Winter Soldier. I love it. And I love like how they told that intimate story. And then Civil War is kind of larger than life. It's a little bit too big for its britches as a Captain America movie. Yeah. So there's a lot of like discussion. Where where would we go with the MCU and, and all that? Uh, Cardi, how do you feel about that? It's just, and y'all mentioned something that I think, like, uh, is really evident when you look at the MCU now, is that, like, number one, they learned the wrong lessons. They took the wrong things from this phase. Like, for example, when uh, when Tony gets stranded with the kid, and the kid is also an asshole, and is just, like, cracking basically the same jokes, um, like, it works for this movie because that's been established for two movies and an Avengers movie now. That that is Tony's character. Tony is the the rich billionaire uh, philanthropist pay, playboy who is gonna make like dry humor. Does not care about their feelings. But no, that does not work for Doctor Strange in every movie that he's in. That does not work for these other characters that you're gonna introduce later. And when it comes to that, when it comes to just the MCU not really figuring out how much of these movies are gonna be self-contained, how much of them are gonna tie into the greater universe. Um, you, you hit the rough spot that they've been in in phase four. And I think a reason why, going back to uh, people not realizing the lack of narrative cohesion earlier on in the MCU, it's because we didn't know what it was leading towards. Like, I believe yeah. this was the first movie uh, after the first Avengers, it right? Was, it, was, yeah. it was beginning phase two. It was so, in the middle. It released, I think it's hilarious, it released in spring or summer of 2013. It's a... Yeah. Christmas movie 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a I shame to like nobody told Shane Black. That. This it is going to be my new Christmas movie, I think. Just to, to segue real fast to that. It's Die Hard, yeah. Iron Man 3, and Violet Night. It's going to be yeah. my three Christmas movies. Well, <laughs> it's, it's been my Christmas movie for a few years now, but I remember watching it being like, why did I just walk out of a Christmas movie? And it's because Shane Black likes to direct Christmas movies, and that's yeah. why they did it that way. Yeah. That, that director style. And, and that's another thing that's like felt in this movie is his like distinctive style that like really makes this different from the rest of the MCU that made Winter Soldier different from the rest of the MCU that made like the movies that were just coming around, out around that time. You felt a lot more heart and a lot more like a lot less similarities between the protagonists than I think you feel nowadays. Like I said, repeating the same comedic structure, mm-hmm. uh, just that struggle to find like balance of how much of this character is going to be this character and how much of them are going to be in the MCU. And I think the only franchise that we've seen do that is like Spider-Man. And even that is like very, very recently with No Way Home. Um, yeah. So, but beyond but, that, I mean. Mm. Well, I was just, I'm going to bring it back to Iron Man 3. Cause I think, I, I mean, I knew we were going to hit this whole, the, the broader dist- discussion. I just thought we'd hit it later, but it's probably <laughs> fine. Uh, so right. bringing it back to Iron Man 3 though, we've all, I think we've discussed in depth about Tony Stark's arc. We all enjoyed it. We liked what he did. I liked how it concluded him taking it the shrapnel. Uh, one thing I couldn't remember doesn't he still have like an arc something to give that symbol in every movie going after this? So he attaches like a magnet because because Pepper's like, well, if you really cared, you wouldn't have gone and done that. And it was during the opening scene of Infinity War. They're walking around that park and uh, he goes, no, these are just nanoparticles to protect us. I want to keep us protected. So he has like basically like a magnet here that he can stra- uh, put the thing to, but it's not an arc reactor anymore. So he like okay. straps the arc reactor that has like houses the nanoparticles in it. Yeah, and that's just he presses for the nano suit mm-hmm. to come on him, right? Yeah, or walking yeah. up the street. Yeah. So it's like an electromagnetic battery, but it's not an arc reactor. It's not like built like an arc reactor. It's not sustaining his life. And then he attaches the other thing to it, and he does the double tap, and the cool you know nano suit yeah. happens. Um, that just made me think of the visuals. Uh, one of my favorite scenes from this movie and the early Iron Man movies entirely are the holodeck scenes where he's like using those holograms. And I, when I was a kid, it was just like the coolest thing. And I think the way they do it is awesome. This movie is no different. I, I've been to the Chinese theater a few times this last year. And that was like my very first time going there. And the whole time I'm thinking of Iron Man in this movie, recreating that whole area just so he can like, you know, uh, what do you call it? CSI, uh, Happy's Killer and all that. Yeah, but I yeah. distinctly remember those scenes. And when I was walking over there, I, that's all I could think about the whole time I was there. So I love that scene. And um, I mean, we talked about it briefly. The suits and everything in this look so polished, so kinetic. There's such force and movement. It doesn't feel clunky or floaty uh, the way I think you describe a lot of later CGI. And you know, it made me miss it. I'm a big fan of like by Endgame, the um, nanotech suit. But I really liked seeing the physical and the practical suits again. Um, yeah, I liked seeing him get in and out of the suits and control the suits without him being there. I forgot yeah. that they did proper Iron Man for a while because I just got so used to nano suits. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the way it all looked and everything like that. So yeah, definitely like more joint movement. Seems like smoother movement because it's it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be smoother because the joints are made of nanobots instead of rigid armor. But I loved, I love the way those visuals looked. Um, I remember I love the Iron Patriot conversation with um, with Hartley where. He's like, well, he's called Iron Patriot now. That's way cooler. No, it's not. Just so there's <laughs> such little uh, dialogue that I'm genuinely heartbroken. We never got to see those two on screen again, even a little bit uh, together. Obviously, we saw him at the funeral and he is going to be in the Iron Wars movie. And I'm excited for him to have a role in that just because the kid was good. I a lot of people have issues with the kid. I thought he was super funny. I remember being a kid myself because this came out a decade ago. So I was probably 14 watching it in theaters and. Uh, and I specifically remember where he's like, you're going to leave me just like my dad. He goes, dad's leave. Don't be a pussy about it. And the word <laughs> pussy in an MCU movie when I was 14, I was like, oh, my God, that's so funny. I was like dying laughing, uh, spilling popcorn because I was a juvenile child. But yeah. <laughs> All right, going back so that cardiac has a chance to get you went through like four topics there. Well, no, I was going <laughs> to hand it off to cardiac. I wanted to I ask like, yeah. what you love. What do you about think the about the suits, too? cardiac? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, look, Mark Mark Forty Two is, in my opinion, the best suit that we've seen to date. Like out, yeah. of, out of everything that Iron Man has been, I love the color scheme of that. 
And like going to the end of the movie, the way like that set piece of him just jumping in and out of suits, seeing uh, the the suit that picks up Rhodey, like it, it's turned into a comedic beat, seeing the way that these like things are turned uh, into basically like self-destruct bombs, putting the extreme, like I just, above all, I love the way that they're used because we don't see that when it comes to like these superhero movies of like, in, in innovative and inventive ways of them using their like powers or their gadgets or whatever yeah. and like a lot of this movie is just about tony stark's like ingenuity just okay let's create this makeshift uh makeshift armor let's use this part of the armor with this tool that i made and let's kill this room of bad guys like the breaking scene of him going to the mandarin's palace that was amazing Chef of just like kiss. Um, just amazing action, amazing direction. I will say, even though I'm not a stickler for editing, that first fight scene of the lady in the cafe, the cuts in there was like a cut like on every impact. That was horrible. But everything <laughs> beyond that. I, like, did, it, I did it, get a little disjointed with her sequence. Like I was kind of yeah, like, okay, yeah. what's going on here? Also, the way that you know, you're talking about the sequence where he eventually gets her with the gas, right? Like, yes. Okay. That, oh my make sure God. I'm thinking the right one. Yeah. I remember when she gets there with the gas. I'm like, that was the stupidest villain death ever. Like she's just like, <laughs> oh, boo! <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And they don't. And and I think it's always weird where it's like, well, you're supposed to be like you're not evil. You're working towards a goal that's maybe not morally righteous, but you're not evil. And th this woman was like. <laughs> I am a villain. Look at me. I burn things, Iron it's, Man. It's like It's weird. funny because right. I think it was pretty much right after that, they revealed that they were all these veterans who just wanted a second <laughs> chance at life. And I'm like, okay, so what? wait. So hopeful, the two veterans that we have that just want a second chance at life, they went like true like comic book, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. kill Iron Man. Like, what? <laughs> just so maniacal yeah. about like, <laughs> get, getting a, a second chance of life. <laughs> like, I don't... I don't understand. But but even the way that like he takes her out, it's like, okay, he put the dog tag in the microwave, he's letting that load, he's just buying time, he's running around the little cafe. It didn't even know, like, yeah, she just kind of stands there dumbfounded getting blown up. It's like just the different ways that this movie, like, again, everything just leads to them highlighting something about Tony Stark that like doesn't get answered in other movies, that doesn't get answered like in other parts of the MCU. I just love that because like my main my main defense to this movie because like I think growing up a lot a lot of us like had a bad uh experience with this movie, whether it be because of the Mandarin twist, whether it be because a lot of people were mad that it was disconnected from the rest of the MCU. Like I remember a lot of people were saying that the kid they wanted to draw the kid to either be eventually Spider Man or become like Iron Lad in the yeah. future. I'm like, why can't he just be a child? Yeah. <laughs> what to, what are we doing? Uh, that was but, the biggest complaint I saw in Endgame that they they were like, "Why did we bring yeah. the kid back? Why why did he get a daughter out of the blue so we can now do this when we could have had the kid?" And then I remember him being at the funeral and everyone being like, "Who is that?" Like yeah. <laughs> he had to age. He had to okay. rely on articles <laughs> oh, to man. just tell everything. But I think, and, and like I said, my main my main defense of this movie is the fact that the second and third act answer this one question about like. Tony Stark and Iron Man as a character. In, in Avengers, in the Helicarrier scene, when everyone's arguing and then you get the slow pan of everyone arguing, the, the upside down shot of the scepter while everyone's, of course, arguing. Um, uh, Steve, and, uh, Steve goes to Tony and he's like, what are you without the suit, right? What kind of man are you? You're not the type of person to crawl over the wire and let another man crawl over you. And the answer to that question is this movie. It's like, what do you do when you strip away your gadgets, when yeah. you strip away your resources, when you don't have a phone, when everyone thinks that you're dead, you don't have any resources. I mean, he eventually calls Rhodey, but like, it's him, a kid, and a box of scraps, essentially, in a garage. Yeah. What are you gonna do? And that that's the most beautiful thing that I think you could do with a character that like is as legendary as, like in the past 20 years of fiction, like, Tony Stark is probably the biggest name, like, when we think about protagonists, movie protagonists, show protagonists. Like, and for this movie to answer that, I think that's, in, in all honesty, that's the biggest achievement that this movie has. Regardless of whatever ha happened with the Mandarin, the action scenes set aside, even though they're amazing, answering that question, I just love that thematically for his character. 
I actually really liked that uh, the Home Alone sequence is what I was thinking of when it happened. When he made yeah. shift all these weapons to take out all the guards getting in. And yeah. it, it, it just reminded me of Home Alone. Like, I was waiting for Tony to just throw marbles underneath one of the guards. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, in a way. He threw those little f***ing bombs he made at the guards. That yeah, but it would have like been funny if it was just true marbles. And you just see hey, one guy like... you bah, got bah, 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 your bah, bah, cake. <laughs> you yep. got a version of it, okay? But it, I love that the makeshift armor sequence is... It's so in, it's so well thought out, and I don't think we get scenes like that. I feel like we kind of go for the MacGuffins more often than not in these stories, rather than like here is you're you're up a creek. You have no Iron Man suit. How are you gonna do this? And it's not like he's overpowering everybody and he's this unstoppable force. If enough people pull up, he's done. They will kill this man, but yeah. they don't. And he and he strategizes really well. Uh, a lot to love about this film. The airplane. I always think about that uh, plane jump sequence where it's like catching, uh, making people grab each other because he can't obviously can't individually catch all the people falling out of the plane. Um, I always love the I'm gonna send a little bit of electricity to your nerves that way your hand clenches so you will not be able to let go of the person next to you because it makes a lot of sense. I'm, yeah. I'm sure the individual wouldn't be that strong. Just that little, that, but that little comment makes it make sense. Like yeah. before that, you'd be like, "That's not gonna work." What do you do? Yeah, it's like that. That dude's gonna his arm's gonna rip off holding that other dude. Uh, they're also. I think that that was filmed practically. I don't remember how they filmed it, but I remember yep. that sequence specifically was like not CG. A lot of it wasn't. It, it was. It, it was. It was filmed practically, and it was filmed with a rotoscope. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> like funny enough, I, I forgot where I learned that. I got to find it just to like fact check, but it was filled with a rotoscope. So I two points I want to bring up. The first one is, I don't know. Did you guys ever watch the, the classic DuckTales show? Yeah. This is, I'm going to show my age, the classic one. Okay. Do you remember how Gizmo Duck would call his armor and it would like electrically come towards him? That's what yeah. I thought of when Tony's waiting for the armor to come at him. I'm like, it's Gizmo Duck. They're just doing Gizmo <laughs> Duck. <laughs> He's like, three, two, one. Ah. Yeah, and no, just nothing happened. Okay, but okay. that's if you tie yourselves up, <laughs> all the good. <laughs> Man, that that came like all the cheese in this movie and the comedy style and even some of the campiness. Like that's like so, so two thousand like two thousands early twenty tens like superhero movie. And, and that's another thing that I think like adds to my nostalgia for it is that it remind a lot of the things remind me of a time before the. Super CGI, even though there's still quite a bit of seat, like that entire uh, suit up like sequence in the beginning of the movie, I think that most of that is like practical, except for like when he actually does the flip. And then, of course, he gets rammed in the butt and his entire suit falls apart. Um, <laughs> but like it's it's so it's so reminiscent of like a time when superhero movies just had like more charm in my opinion. Like, not to have a stickler, not to be a stickler or anything, but, like, it just felt like they had more charm, they had more heart, they had, yeah. like, more individualness to it that made, like, okay, this is why Iron Man is on my lunch kit, because of this movie right here. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's being 10 watching this movie was just, man. And that's the stupid. question, right? Is it that they are actually like that and they're not like that now, or is it our nostalgia for these films? Because I know a lot of people will... Um, I'm not dissing the Raimi movies before you guys come at me in the comments, but a lot of people will talk about the Raimi movies <laughs> as if they're like cinematic masterpieces and they're not like cheese and camp. And it's like, no, they're amazing, but they're so cheesy and campy. And me personally, I would take, you know, uh, Into the Spider-Verse or Spider-Man No Way Home any day of the week over a Raimi movie. But it's not to insult how great those films are. Uh, but people have an incredible nostalgia for their very first Spider-Man on screen. You know, they have incredible nostalgia for those stories at that time. So I wonder which one it is. Is it, is it that there's less cheese? And I'm sure, depending on the film, there is less cheese, uh, less charm, or is it that we're older? Because um, I mean, be, be, oh, come on, Benny, cheese, get it together. You're all over the place today. <laughs> what no, are you uh, talking? What do you mean I'm all over? Oh, this is all you. I watching. thought of something. Uh, there, I saw something on TikTok like a week ago about Fortnite, and this is an interesting thing to say because it's gone on for five, six years, it's the first thing that people have like continued to play like a video game where it's the exact same game for six, seven years and everyone's still playing the same one. But people are like, I miss how Fortnite used to be because it obviously used to have different guns and you didn't build as fast, whatever, blah, 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 blah. They're like, this was the golden era. Why did they make the game so bad? And it's like, no, you missed that time of your life. And this movie made me miss that time of my life and it made me like aware of like, I like this, but it does make me miss just being 
young without any responsibilities. My, I was in eighth grade when this movie came out. All I had to worry about was crayons or whatever you do in eighth grade. I don't know. <laughs> but you, had, you did crayons in eighth grade? A I was lot a of very, things now make more sense about you. I was anyway. in a decelerated <laughs> learning program. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I was going to agree. It's actually studies have proven that nostalgia is more about the time period you're remembering and less about what's going on. But I do think, well, I do know your point is, are we just looking fondly at nostalgia or... I do think that MCU following phase four and be it because of COVID and them trying to cram so many projects into phase four or whatever, there's almost a cookie cutter format they they fell back into because they were going away from it and they tried a few different things, but they, they, everyone was like, no, Eternals is terrible. So like, okay, back to the cookie cutter stuff. It was awful. <laughs> and it was just kind of a weird middle ground and all that. But yeah. the one thing, I, the last point I wanted to bring about Iron Man three, I wanted to ask you both about is See, now you made me lose a thought because you go through like nine different points. Is this what's like working with me? Damn it. Anyway. <laughs> Purposefully so. Oh, there was one more. Oh, Iron Patriot. What are your thoughts on Iron Patriot? Because that is not Iron Patriot out of the comics. That is a new variation. That is a new thing. What did you think about him? Cool color, cool gag. <laughs> yeah. For, for this movie, that's about it. Like, I feel like, like at the time, of course, I didn't have this expectation. I was just freaking tense. But like looking back on it, I'm like, okay, there's a... There's a lot of like subtleties that this is hinting at with like uh, government involvement when it comes to international affairs. Like you have that you have two scenes I think where he's like barging into a house and like holding guns at like this this family that's like international and like it's it's like an awkward thing of him like picking up this phone call. I don't know. I thought that that was like a key in for something that was like supposed to be set up and then maybe talked about with the Sokovia Accords or whatever. I don't know. I feel like just overall roadie in general, and especially just the Iron Patriot suit, is like very underutilized. When yeah. it comes to just the they, I mean, they went with the concept of Iron Patriot is the bad Iron Man. That's what he is in the comics. I believe it's Norman Osborn. I wasn't mm -hmm. I, yep. it, it, during Dark Reign and all that stuff. So, uh, But that's what they were going with, but we didn't have Norman Osborn, so you had to do like Rhodey and then Killian takes it and yeah. gives it to one of the guys. I think um, they just wanted the visual when you're yeah. looking at the way they did it. I think they just like wanted to have... A cool looking Iron Man suit. They already did War Machine the way War Machine was, and they knew they were gonna go back to it. So they're like, let's let's play around it for a movie. Yeah, I do want to say you bring up him barging into the houses, and you thought that was funny. That's actually what we did a lot in Iraq. We would actually <laughs> kick in a door, go in. All right, everyone down. Uh, hey, command. I think you got the building wrong. Oh, you want me no. to stay here? Okay, cool. All right, yeah, I'll hang out here, I guess. I, I tell this story a few times, but there's one time that we broke into a house at like 1 a.m. and looked for their guns. They had no guns. Everything was fine. And command told us to wait there. And the guy offered us chai tea. And we sat around with him for two hours and chatted about his area. Oh, <laughs> like, <man. laughs> the more oh, you man. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's what we do. You, you just The army likes to do it first, then find out if we got the house right. <laughs> Not a great policy, mind you. <laughs> a legitimately bad policy. You know, it's it's like, look we're at all that. on the same page. Anybody in the cop is like, yeah, well, to protect America. No, that's a bad thing. We don't do that. That's not good. <laughs> that's a bad thing. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good thing. I just no, said no. I didn't say it, you said it. I'm saying I it to our say, comment uh, yeah. section. I like. I would love to make the joke of I have a nickel for every time, and it's twice, and that's odd that I have. I if I had a nickel for every time we did that, I'd probably have a couple dollars. So oh my god, <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. That's terrifying. There's quite a few times. One time I had a family try to give me their daughter, marry her, take her to America, but that's another story. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. The Iron Man. An Iron Man cool, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, this was a great discussion. I really appreciate you being here, Cardiac. And if you have any other movies you want to watch, hit us up. I'm sure we can work it out. But oh, yeah. uh, for anybody who happened to not pay attention to the beginning, who are you and where can they find you? Uh, again, my name is Cardiac K. Um, I make anime analysis, comic book character analysis, comic book media analysis videos. So if you like that or are interested in that, uh, check out my channel. So. He also yeah, makes Young Justice hate videos. So if you uh, like that. Uh, you my original idea was to invite him on here to team up with me against uh, Hussin, but uh, <laughs> he yeah, picked Iron Man 3. We'll do that discussion another day. I'm down. Yeah. That is, <laughs> we'll that make is him watch Gotham Knights with us. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, thanks so much for being a cardiac. And thank you guys for watching. Check out our sponsors. I think Hassan named them all. So into the AM, Gamer Subs, use the appropriate codes. Links are down below. Go click the link down below to check out Cardiac's channel. And don't forget, Hassan does have other stuff he works on. You can take all of your hate comments, go watch all of his stuff over there, and just throw them that way. That way we have a clean lines over here. Yes, sir. YouTube.com says Bad Days Pod. I see every comment. It's a small channel. <laughs> oh, right. my God. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time right here.